So we're continuing our series this morning in the book of 2 Peter, calling this series Last Words. And we'll talk more again about what that actually means in a second. But there is a great debate that is happening these days around the person of Jesus, who he really is and what he came to do. The questions become, was he just a wise but completely ordinary carpenter who became a well-respected teacher but never claimed to be God? Was he a religious zealot trying to lead a rebellion against the oppressive Roman government to free his people? Or was he a lunatic who had outlandish ideas about being the son of God? Or was he truly the son of God who came to take away the sins of the world and will one day return as Christians have long taught? This debate is filled with passionate backing, and it is not without any sort of controversy. But we have to ask the question, who was he really? What was the purpose for his life, and why did he come? And we also have to ask ask the question, why is it important for us to understand him for who he really is? Well, it's important because if we change the identity of Jesus, then we change the gospel that we believe in that is the foundation for our faith. For example, if we start to say that Jesus wasn't actually God, what that does is then we no longer have a person who could have been a perfect sacrifice, who could have lived a life without sin, and thus our sins would not be taken care of. Or if we say, that he was not human, he was simply just God floating around in spirit, then he couldn't have actually physically died and been that perfect sacrifice. And so now it totally changes the entire gospel. And so what we're going to look at this morning is Peter's going to give some reminders. He's going to give three reminders to the people that he was writing to about who Jesus really is and what he came to do. And so this is our main thought for this morning, is that Jesus is the Savior of the world who came to take away sins. He is the sovereign King who will come to judge the world and its deeds, and he fulfills messianic prophecies as the Son of God. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking through verses 12 through 21. If you do not have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab a Bible from the seat in front of you, these brown hardcover back Bibles. It'll be on page 1,225, so go ahead and do that. But while you're turning there, let me just give you a quick reminder of the background of the book of 2 Peter. We believe that these were some of the last words that Peter ever wrote, the last words that were recorded of his own. And we believe that he died shortly after this, maybe a few years after he wrote this. um, And he was executed during the persecution of Emperor Nero of the Roman government. This letter was written to a large collection of churches in Asia Minor. And he was coming straight after and he was critiquing the beliefs of these false teachers that were denying that Jesus would ever return and as a result we were not accountable for our deeds. We could live however we want and these false teachers lived very licentious lifestyles going after whatever they wanted, pursuing any pleasures. And so this morning Peter is going to kind of begin part of his farewell address to these churches that he's built a relationship with and he wants them to remember what he taught long after he passes away and that he wants these words to last forever because they are the words of the truth and the words of the gospel. And so last week, Peter told the audience that that his divine power has given us everything we need to live a godly life and that we now get to participate in God's divine nature, meaning we get to become like God. We get to live like God in the world and that God's spirit, God's grace enables us to do what he demands of us to live a life of pleasing him, to obey him, that God's grace is within us to to be able to do that. So this week, he's going to remind uh, his audience of the fact that Christ is who he says he is and that, and he's trying to validate what he has said for years and years about the person and work of Jesus. And so let's go ahead and begin. We're going to look at verse, we're going to start in verse 12. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. 
And so Peter makes it essential that he is going to continually remind them of these things. And these things, what he means is the things he just talked about. God's divine nature, giving us everything we need to live a godly life, participating in the divine nature, all of that. He's going to continue to remind them of these things. He's not going to stop. He's going to be relentless in that. He's, because I think we, if we're honest, the human mind, one of its best learners, is, one of its best ways that it learns is by the way of repetition. We need, we need things repeated to us over and over again because sometimes we're a little slow on the uptake. I know that's true in my life. Sometimes God says something and it takes about seven or eight times for me to, to finally click in my mind. So Peter wants to continue to do this even though he says, you know them. You know these things. He has taught them these things already, but he doesn't want them to be easily swayed by false teachers that are going to come in and say, no, this is actually the truth. This is what you should actually believe and this is how you can live now because of what we believe. And so he's trying to say, Stay away from that. Stay away from the corrupt thinking. Stay away from these false teachers and be firmly grounded in the truth. And he says that. Be established. That word established means to strengthen, to make more firm. It should remind us that the power of the gospel should strengthen our belief. That when we believe in the person and work of Jesus, that he came and lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again on the third day, and that he is, that is, gives us new life when we put our faith in him, not just forgiveness of sins, but a whole new life. So when we possess this truth and we believe it, it should basically firm us up to be strong in the Lord, and we would not be swayed by any false teachers that come around trying to say this is how you ought to be really living and what you ought to be believing. And so if we are types of people that are spiritually gullible, the things that we need to start doing is saying, I'm going to become more grounded in God's word. I'm going to know this thing more. I'm also going to become grounded in the gospel that I would understand this truth more and more deeply so that my life would not be swayed by anything that would come my way in terms of what they would teach me about what the world and life is all about. And he makes sure, he says, I, that he thinks this is a right thing for him to do. This is his apostolic right. He is an apostle of God, of Jesus. Jesus gave him this job, and so it is right for him to do this. But then he says to refresh your memory. The, the translation there in the NIV is a little soft because it's more of like a firm reminder, like something you would kind of tell your children to kind of get them to move, get going. Like, I've told you this before. Let's get moving on it. And it's trying to provoke them to understand the gospel in a much deeper way, to awaken them from a spiritual dullness. And if I'm honest, some of the things that I think that ca categorize a lot of American Christianity is this idea of spiritual dullness, that a lot of people just don't know what their mission and their call is as followers of Christ, to go and follow him and go to the ends of the world and make disciples of all nations. Sometimes we're a little bit slow on the uptake on that as well, that we don't go for that, that we look for other things to be satisfying to us or to be living on mission for other things like our jobs and our families. And so Peter wants to remind them of these things as long as he lives in the tent of his body. And what he means by the tent is it's this term that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5. And it's this term to describe the weaknesses and inadequacies of the earthly body that we live in now. And that someday Peter is now going to put it aside. And someday he is going to pass away. But he's going to continue to refresh their memory as long as he is alive. He's going to be, it's going to be a relentless pursuit to share the message of the gospel as long as he is alive. And he says, because I know that I will soon put it aside. He knows this is a fact that someday he will pass away. And it's not just because we all know that we're going to pass away, but he knows that it's going to happen soon. The Emperor Nero's persecution was rampant at this point, and so he knew that it was coming. And he even says that even Jesus kind of warned him, warned him of it, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. What we believe he's saying here is he's connecting to this idea from John chapter 21, the very end of John's gospel, where he is talking about, he's talking to Peter, and he says, you will be stretched out and you will go somewhere not of your choosing. Basically, you're going to be executed in a way that's not of your choosing in terms of you're going to be taken away. You're, this is not what you're going to want. You're not going to want to be executed. And so he, what we believe happened, we see tradition is that he was actually crucified upside down. So crucifixion is horrible enough, but he was put upside down. Actually, 
That was by his choice because he did not want to die the same death as Jesus, die in the same way. So he wanted to be crucified upside down. And so with the persecutions of Nero surrounding him and the other believers, he knew that it, it was only a matter of time when Nero would catch him and he would execute him. And so as a result of this, he says, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure. Okay, he said that make every effort phrase twice in the last 11 verses. And so we see this. So we see that Peter is basically practicing what he preaches. He's going to put forth every effort. He's going to be relentless to pursue God. He's going to be relentless to share the gospel message with whoever and wherever he is called to go. And that is the same call that is on every single one of us that we would say, wherever I go, wherever I am, whoever I'm talking to, I need to be relentless and to be sharing the gospel. It doesn't mean you need to be annoying. It just needs to be that you are saying, this is my mission and I'm going, everything I do and every relationship I build is so that I can share the gospel of Christ at the proper time with these people. And he wants them, he wants them to remember these things going on beyond his life. And this is a idea that he wants a lasting legacy of the truth of what he taught. Not of himself, but what of the things that he taught. And look at this. This has been fulfilled 2,000 years later. We're still talking about Peter and the things that he taught. God has done some amazing things. But when, again, he talks about these things, what he means is he's talking about this gospel message that Jesus is not only the savior of the world, but that he came to redeem it. So this is our first reminder is that Jesus is the Savior who came not only to save the world, but to redeem it. When we look back at what Peter had just said, he had talked about how we have the divine nature that gives, or the divine power living in us that gives us the ability to, li do, to live a godly life. And God supplies what he demands. And so as a result, God is trying to redeem humanity, bring us into a new life with Jesus. That when we put our faith in him, it's not just that our sins are covered and paid for, but that we are given a whole new life, a whole new mindset, a whole new will through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that the importance of this message is in the fact of what Peter says, that he knows he is soon gonna, going to put his body, his earthly body aside. None of us have a guarantee whatsoever that we will see the next day. We just don't know. So as a result, we need to be the type of people that say, because I know my time is short, I need to be ready to share this message at any time to share the gospel because this is my top priority. This is my number one mission in my life. And we see that through Peter's testimony, we see people had come to know Christ and had seen the way that he was living. So that's got to be the same for us, that we would live in a way that would compel other people to come to faith in Christ. And so the question that, become, that we need to ask becomes, does my life reflect the fact that I believe Jesus not only saves us, but redeems us? That God wants to work a plan in our lives to make us more like him. It's not about bringing good things into our life, you know, possession type things, but bringing the good things of him more and more presence into our lives so that we become more like him and look like him. Are we willing to go to the length that Peter went to to proclaim this message so that, or, or are we more uh, focused on the comfort that we enjoy on our, in our every single, everyday lives? And then lastly, do we believe truly that God can not only uh, that, that, that he can work in people's lives, but that he deeply wants to work in our lives to make us more like Christ. Let's continue, verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So again, Peter is answering some objections by these false teachers that were coming around. And what they were basically saying, what we believe is that they were saying that what Peter and the apostles were teaching were fables. These were myths. These weren't true. They weren't based in any sort of reality or any sort of truth. They were just simply making it up. They were looking, probably looking around the instability of their world and saying it's just going to continue the way it always has been. And so we 
Jesus isn't going to return. There is no coming judgment for the way that I live. But Peter is making sure he says, this is absolutely not the case because he says, we were eyewitnesses. We saw this. But then he makes sure to say, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, when we look at that phrase, we need to look at, we need to interpret the, the words coming and power together. Because this word coming means, it's, it's the word parousia in Greek. And what it means is, it can mean presence, but it can also mean coming of a king or ruler. So if a, if a ruler was coming to a city, they would say the word parousia. They're saying the king is coming. The king is coming. And so they would prepare and be ready for that king to arrive. And they knew that there could be trouble if they weren't up, living up to the way that they were supposed to be living. And so they use this word to say that this is, that he's coming, but he's coming in power, meaning he's not coming quiet like he did the first time when he came as a baby in the middle of a nowhere city like Bethlehem. He is coming loud. He is coming publicly. We will know it. We will see it. And we will see him in all of his glory. And what Peter does next is when he says this eyewitnesses of his majesty, he's now going to connect it to this idea of something, an event that happened in his life. And remember, he's saying eyewitnesses. I saw this for myself. This wasn't a made up story. I saw what happened. And here's what he tells us happened. He's going back to this event that's called the transfiguration. This happens in Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, Jesus grabs Peter, James, and John. They go on top of this mountain, and Jesus is transfigured before them, meaning he is completely changed. And basically, he is changed into the, all the glory of God. He is, re, he is revealing himself to them as the holy God, the creator God, the one who has made all things. And then he makes sure to say that this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. God the Father says that about Jesus. This is my son. This is me. And Peter is making some very clear statements here. He's saying basically that God the Father, God the Son, they're one and the same. When he says this is my son, they are exactly the same in essence and in character and in nature. They share the same glory because God doesn't share his glory with anybody else but himself. So just with himself. So by saying that he received honor and glory, he's saying Jesus is God. He's making sure to make that very clear to us and that they heard God speak audibly. It wasn't something like an impression in their heart, but actually heard God speak. And he makes sure to say, we ourselves heard this voice. This was a voice that they clearly heard and it came from heaven and it was on this sacred mountain. And that the things that God was saying, that this is his son, the same essence and nature of him, who he loves and he's pleased with him, that this is where God takes great pleasure and joy in Jesus. But it's interesting that Peter uses this event as a proof that Jesus is going to come again. Because what he's basically saying is he's connecting this idea that the transfigured Jesus is this promised king that is going to come, who's going to rule over all the world. He is this figure of the son that is prophesied about in the Old Testament through this event that's called the day of the Lord. This is what the day of the Lord basically is. It's the day that God will come and he will judge all people for their deeds, whether they are wicked or whether they are righteous. And so for the day of the Lord, for the wicked, it is a time of judgment and it should be a time of fear as it says frequently throughout the Old Testament. But that the day of the Lord should be for those who believe in Christ and are followers of Jesus or were, uh, had given their, their and have believed in him and believed in God, that that would be a joyous thing. That should be a light because it's a rescue. It's a full salvation. It's the full culmination of what Jesus has talked about or that the, God, the full culmination of the gospel that we will fully become like God in that day for those of us who believe in Jesus. And so he's making this connection that this, that Jesus is this guy, that he is the exalted king of the earth, that the transfiguration proved that, that he was no mere man, that he is God in flesh and that he is this character that is going to someday return again. And so this is our second reminder 
that Jesus is the coming is is coming as king to judge the world and its deeds. So at this point we have to ask this question. Are we living our lives in a manner that Christ might return at any time as king of this world? Are we living our lives with that mindset that the king could be coming at any time? So our lives need to be reflecting of him. Our lives need to, we need to live in a way that is urgent, recognizing he could come truly at any time. And that if anybody tells you that they can predict when Jesus is coming, they are either lying or they are simply very deceived in believing that they could predict that. We are left in the scriptures, we're left in the Bible basically told we don't know when Jesus will return. I think that's so that we have urgency to say that we can't point to this date and say, okay, we can tell people up to this point that we would say we're going to be, we're going to be telling people about Jesus up until that day, until he comes and that we wouldn't be caught up in the world or entrapped in sin. Jesus says in Mark 13, 36, that if, if he comes suddenly, he's talking about the son of man, do not let him find you sleeping. And what he means is don't be sleeping on the call that you have as followers of Christ. Don't be sleeping on it. Don't be uh, abdicating that responsibility to go and share the gospel with as many people as you possibly can. Also, don't be sleeping in the fact that you are now like that and following the pleasures of the world and entrapped in sin, but instead be living a life that's saying, Jesus is my king and he will return at any time and I look forward to that day. And we need to recognize that Jesus is not just our savior, but he is our sovereign Lord and king and that we are accountable for every single one of our deeds. Yes, there are high expectations that Jesus has for us, but remember, God's grace supplies what he demands. We learned that last week. And that as well, that knowing that Jesus could return at any time, we start to look at everything we have with, a, with an open hand, saying that Jesus could come back at any time and he's going to take it anyway. So we live with it in a temporary mindset, knowing that our, the priority of our lives is truly to follow Christ and that all of these are secondary. And that we give them back to him, already knowing that they are his and that it is our top priority to follow him, to share the hope of the gospel, and then use whatever we possibly can in order to do that, that he has already given us, that he is our top priority. Let's continue, verse 19. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. So he basically is saying in the very first part of verse 19, he's telling them that because of this transfiguration, it now filters everything else of what the Old Testament prophecies have taught. We now see all of that through the transfiguration because Jesus is that coming king, that Messiah, that son of God. We know he's coming. And so now we see all of those passages in that light. And so he's, he's actually kind of making these statements to say that this is more reliable. Now we, ha we can believe this fully. And he's kind of trying to refute the false teachers who were trying to say there wouldn't be a coming judgment because Christ isn't returning. So we can do whatever we want. But we, when we look at what one of the passages says, we see it in Psalm 2, King David is talking about in verse 7 how there is going to be a, the sun is going to come. And that, listen to this, he will dash the nations into pieces and break them with a rod of iron. This psalm is a warning. It's a warning for the nations to serve the Lord with fear and to celebrate God's rule with trembling, knowing that he will come and judge the world. And no, we don't think of God as simply this um, terrifying figure because those of us who have given our lives to Christ, we know that all of that wrath is gone from us. It has been taken away. But those, of, those people who have not given their lives to Christ, they are still up for that judgment. And so it's an, it's an invitation saying, come to him. Come to him because he is a good and kind God and wants to give you, wants to bless you, wants to give you a relationship with him through the person of Jesus. And so by identifying 
Jesus as this character, as the son of God. He's confirming the, about the Old Testament, the prophetic words from about the day of the Lord. And Peter is basically saying our interpretation that we have here was given to us by Jesus. And he says, and you will do well to pay attention to it. It's really important that you pay attention. But the, here's how was you, in that day and age, this was usually thought of. Listening and doing were two sides of the same coin. I know many of us who are parents in here, we might have kids who are hearing what we're saying, but we have seen them many times not follow through, okay, and not do it. In the Bible, uh, the way that they think of it, hearing and doing are two sides of the same coin. So if you hear it, you're going to do it. It's not in one ear and out the other. It's a constant, I hear what God says, and now I'm going to respond and do what he has called me to do. And so what's at stake here? And why it's important for us to pay attention is it's not just some book that some random guys wrote all years, all those years ago, but that this is judgment or salvation, death or life. The most paramount of things that could exist in our world are right there for us. But that he wants to remind us that for those of us who have faith, that this belief that Jesus is this figure that was talked about in the Old Testament, he should be a light shining in a dark place. And sometimes we forget that, there, that we live in a dark world. We live in a broken and hurting world and that even inside of ourselves, we have a broken and hurting heart and that if Jesus comes into it, he brings light and that we should truly be ignited in that. We should be excited. And so if we think about church, we think about listening to the gospel, hearing about who Jesus is and that doesn't ignite a fire in your hearts, then it's time to start checking our spiritual pulse. And to see if it's really alive because this should be something that should be constantly bringing light to us and peace and hope and joy and satisfaction because that's who Jesus is and that's what he does. But he says that this will be a light shining in the dark place until the day dawns, meaning the day that Jesus will return and the morning star rises in your hearts. And what he's talking about actually is that when Jesus returns someday, we won't need the light shining in the dark place because everything will now be light. We will see Jesus for all he is and, and the whole world will be full of light and the broken, hurting world that we've been a part of will be no more. But we need to recognize that we are also beacons of hope and light to the rest of the world. That if we have been changed by Jesus, we now go out and be changers to the world, that we would be a mini beacon of hope for the rest of the world because we have been changed by Christ. So then what he says in verse 20, he makes it very clear. And he's, what he's talking about is he's kind of straight up attacking the opponents and telling them essentially that what they believe about the fact that they say that Jesus won't return, he says that doesn't come from God. That doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. That comes from yourself. That comes from your own interpretation. And so Peter is basically saying, our interpretation, we got, I got it from Jesus. I got it from the Spirit. I got it from God himself that this is the truth, that Jesus is this figure and we ought to put our faith in him. And so these ideas of scripture, when we, talk, when we use the word scripture, we're talking about this Bible. All of this is scripture. And that none of it happens simply by the prophet's own will. And he clarifies this in verse 21 because it's never, it never had its origin in the human will. Every time you see a prophecy being made in the Bible, it says, thus says the Lord. It comes from God. It doesn't come from a human being having a thought and then God validating it. It comes straight from God himself. And oftentimes this is why I have a really hard time believing that there is true legitimate prophecy nowadays because this was a very special office for a special time that God was trying to deliver this message to people. And we have a very full message in our Bibles of what God has done and what he wants to continue to do in our lives. And that oftentimes we forget the kind of the standards here that were given to the prophets. So we have to understand a couple things about prophets in the Bible. First of all, they, were, they had two jobs. They were foretellers, so basically telling of the future that God would give them, reveal to them what was going to happen in the future. But they also were forth telling, basically, that they could speak the words of God that would cut to the heart, that would convict people of sin and 
call them to repent and come to a relationship with him. And so those are the jo- that's the job of the prophet. But here's the thing. In the book of Deuteronomy, the standard for the prophet is extremely high. The standard was 100% accuracy or else they were not from God. And if they prove and if they were wrong about something they were to be stoned to death was the command that Moses gave this is how serious God took the phrase thus says the Lord if someone says that and then it doesn't come true they are not speaking from God and they are actually Satan is actually trying to use them to distract and so here's what he says and he actually kind of gives us a picture of how our Bibles even came to be He says, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These prophets, they were human beings like you and I, but God chose them for this specific task and he utilized their personalities, their writing styles, their idiosyncrasies, their life experiences, their circumstances that they found themselves in. He used all of that in order to write scripture. He didn't possess their bodies and take them over and then they wrote and then they completely forgot about what happened. He utilized their personalities. He utilized them in how he created them. He directed them. And that word, it says that they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's the same word that is used when a wind carries a ship along in the sea. That God led them in this direction. God inspired them. This is something that Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where he says all scripture is God breathed. That God breathed it into life. That God inspired it. He gave the ideas and the truths to the writers and then they used their personalities and their their unique individual humanity in order to write these things. It's not inspiration like a a great idea pops up in your head, but God directing and leading. And this happened in the Old Testament through prophets and it happens in the New Testament through apostles or through those who had the authority of the apostles to write. And so here's our third reminder to keep in mind as we continue. It'll say proof on there. That's because I missed it and forgot to change it. But Jesus is the fulfillment of messianic prophecies in scripture and will bring light to the world. And we read that again. Jesus is the fulfillment of messianic prophecies in scripture and he will bring light to the world. Let me give you a couple examples of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled that are ones that he could not have possibly taken care of himself. First of all, where he was born. It says in Micah 5, 2, that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. I don't think a baby can control where they are born, okay? So he was, and it says in Matthew 2, verse 1, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Then it says in Hosea 11, 1, that this Messiah figure will have to go to Egypt, and it says, out of Egypt, I will call my son. And we hear this story again in Matthew 2, verses 14 through 15, where Joseph hears of the rumors of King Herod coming after the boys in the uh, the town, the young boys. And so Joseph then is told by God to leave and he goes to Egypt. And eventually they come out when they hear that Herod has passed away. And I can't go into much more detail than that because there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, how you will know it is him. And I can't possibly go over all of them, but if you look at just eight, and this is something that the famous apologist Josh McDowell likes to do when he speaks. I heard him do this one time. It was amazing. Where if Jesus fulfilled just eight of those 300 prophecies, you know what the likelihood of that happening is? The odds of a human being fulfilling eight of those prophecies? It is one in 10 to the 17th power. I'll just, I'll say it like this. It is one in 100 quadrillion. I don't think that's a number that we can possibly conceive of. It just, to me, when I hear a number that big, I just go, that means a lot, a lot. (laughs) It's, I can't process that many numbers. But that's just with eight. So if Jesus fulfilled 48 of the prophecies, the number jumps to one in 10 to the 157th power. Like I thought about looking up, you know, the denominations of, you know, where you go million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, and finding out what that would be. That would have taken too long. I didn't have time for that. That is a huge number. But that's just 48. And Jesus fulfilled all 300 plus of these prophecies. 
So Jesus, the odds of Jesus being all of these things is incredibly astronomical. We actually don't have the number. It might be too hard for us to even comprehend. And that this coming, so we believe he's coming, and that if he has already come and all these prophecies have been fulfilled, there are more that have yet to be fulfilled. We can trust that these came from God and that someday Jesus will return and that for those of us who have put our faith in him, he will come as a light to the world to bring us hope, to bring us joy, to bring us satisfaction, but to also bring us into a place where we know God deeply and intimately and are passionately pursuing him and following him and sharing the love that he has for all people. So at the beginning, I said that knowing Jesus for who he really is will lead us to a proper understanding of the gospel. So when we see that he is this coming king that's coming to judge, we are left with a choice and we should all think about it. If we have not given our lives to Christ, he's coming to judge our, the, the evil and the sin and the wickedness that is in all of our hearts. But if we, have been, if we have given our lives to Christ, every single one of those are covered and that this day of the Lord will be a coming day of righteousness and being fully saved to become like God, that he will complete that work on that day. So my question to you is, is where do you stand? When you hear about who Jesus really is and that he fulfilled all these prophecies, does this lead you to a place to say, yes, I want to put my faith in this Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to hear what he has to say. But for those of us who are, who are Christians in this room, we need to recognize that we would say, what am I going to do now to learn more about who Jesus is? How am I going to keep myself from being persuaded and led astray into believing other things that other teachers teach that are outside of the Bible? How am I going to handle that? But I think for all of us, we need to take inventory and to do what Jesus asked of his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 when he asked them the question, who do you say that I am? Who do we say that he is? And I think the testimony of, of, of Jesus in the scriptures is extremely clear. Jesus is the savior of the world who came to take away sins. He is the sovereign king who will come to judge the world and its deeds and fulfills messianic prophecies as the son of God. Will you put your faith in him this morning? Or will you move on from this morning and hear what was said and not let it process and not follow through on it and say, I want to give my life to this God. Not just out of fear, but out of a knowledge of saying, because God hated evil and wickedness and death so much, he went to the cross and died for my sins so that he could pave the way that I could have a new life in him when I put my faith in him. So where is it, what's it going to be? Which direction are we going to go? Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are, that you do deeply love us. That God, that you must confront evil. You must deal with it for you to be a good and holy and loving God. And so God, you have to deal with it in and of ourselves too. But God, thank you for Jesus that paid the price for our sins when we put our faith in you. And so Jesus, we want to be people who believe the testimony of scripture about who you are that you are all of these things. You are the savior of the world. You are the king. You are the Messiah who's gonna come as the son of God. God, help us to believe all of these things and more. And we pray this in your name, amen. Amen. We invite you to, again, pull out the communication card uh, to check any of the boxes on there that, are, uh, that stick out to you. There's three on there about ways to respond to what I just talked about, but you can also then uh, do the journal, the next one, and that's for next week, uh, journal entry number three, and then as well, if something was said this morning that said makes you want to commit your life to Christ, you can do that, commit to him for the first time. So we're going to move into time of prayer to pray for our offering. Uh, if the offering is here, this is not a, an obligation or a guilt trip for you to give. We want you to give out of a cheerful heart well, because of what God has done for you. And we have a generous church, but we want you to, to do this because also you're doing this as an act of worship and saying to God, my money is not as important to, to me as you are. And so let's take a moment to pray. Jesus, thank you for this morning again. Jesus, we pray for our offering, God, that it would be a pleasing sacrifice to you, God, that we would sacrifice to the point of knowing that we are 
God having to make some choices to uh, not go after other things because of the fact that we are giving to you. God, this is about a mission. This isn't about uh, obligation, but God, to, to further your kingdom so that more people may come to know Jesus. And so we also pray, Lord, for our children and our youth. God, we thank you for an amazing week at high school camp. We pray for you to continue the work that you started in, every, in all of our lives. And Jesus, for our children, that we would raise them up to be disciples, that we would show them what it means to be followers of Christ and to show them who you are and your great love for them. And so we thank you and we pray this in your name. Amen.